this morning outside a motel in suburban Detroit after a 10-hour standoff. Police say the officers had come to their motel room to serve a warrant for a $286 bad check. The family reportedly shot a thousand rounds of gunfire before it gave up. Why were three Inkster police officers gunned down last night while trying to serve warrants for bad checks of all things? This time last night, as Eyewitness News taken out the scene, we didn't have answers. Tonight, we know more. The three officers had walked into a war at the Bungalow Motel on Michigan Avenue in Inkster and lost. Dead are Dan Dubiel, a veteran on the Inkster force, and rookie Clay Hoover. Both wearing bulletproof vests were shot by automatic weapon fire. Both probably died instantly. A third officer, Sergeant Ira Parker, ran to the motel room where he heard the shot. He was killed as well. We were met with automatic gunfire and we took cover did and called. Gunfire? No, we did not. Not at that time. Inside were suspect 66-year-old Alberta Easter, her 47-year-old son Roy Lemons, and two other adult sons. They had with them gas masks. 300 rounds of M14 ammunition, flares, and handguns. They emerged from rooms 105 and 106 early this morning after Reverend Jim Holly convinced them to give themselves up. Tonight, police are saying the suspects may have fired up to 1,000 shots before surrendering. They'll all be arraigned on charges tomorrow. You know, tonight, Kathy, police are still searching in the backgrounds of those four suspects tonight. Who are these people? Our Roseanne Sarah tonight talked to those who knew Alberta Easter and the three Lemon brothers reported to be her sons. Those who knew these folks say that their lives were just as much a mystery years ago as they are even last night. They came from Cleveland, Ohio. I believe she was in real estate, but to my knowledge, the, the three sons never did have a job. Uh, the one was a musician, but... You know, he, he never worked. Ron Murphy was a recording engineer at this now boarded-up recording studio on Livernois in Detroit that he says was owned by the four suspects between 1969 and 1971. We did produce some records at that studio. That was legitimate then. They, but they had their, uh, their mind was set on getting, you know, $50 million, $100 million. Uh, I even seen deals of, like... Five hundred million dollars. Murphy says this home on John Hicks Road in Wayne was the last permanent address of Alberta Easter and Roy, George, and William Lemon. Neighbors told me the suspects led mysterious lives, telling them they were international financiers. Murphy believes they were involved in illegitimate businesses. I, I know I had been to their house many times, and, and they were getting worried about certain investors that they had had in the past would maybe come back to them. And uh, they, they, they did have some, some rifles and things at that time. I guess they would get some investors to put up small amounts of money, maybe 10000 20000 and they would just use that money to, to keep furthering uh, the, the bigger deal. Last year, they said they were buying this restaurant out in Wayne, so I was never really too sure exactly what they were doing. Terry Steele manages a car rental company in Inkster. He says Roy Lemon rented a car from him and in May wrote out a bad check. Steele talks about what happened when he tried to repossess the car. And he reached around the door and grabbed me by the neck. He ripped my shirt, grabbed me around the neck and had me out. And I just put the car in gear and started driving and he held on and dragged for, oh, 40, 50 yards. So I fell off. The suspects apparently left a trail of death. They were to be evicted today from the Bungalow Motel, the scene of the crime, for being $5,000 behind on their rent. They also had reportedly slipped out of the Knights Inn in Romulus earlier this year, leaving behind a $12,000 debt. Roseanne, Sarah, Channel 2, Eyewitness News. And on the other side of this story, for the people who knew or worked with those three Inkster officers killed, a day does not get much tougher than this one. Fellow officers carried on today in disbelief that their friends had been killed. Most felt certain the three never even had a chance to defend themselves. The cousin of Sergeant Ira Parker remembered how her uncle always looked at her. This man was here Thursday afternoon when the shooting started. He was shooting at anything and everything, and I ran from here, and I ran across the street to, the, to that house over there, and then I made it to the gas station, and I stayed over there behind the car, and I mean, I ain't never heard no fire like that in my life. I mean, they were just crazy. It was like a gangster movie or whatever. I just couldn't believe this was real. I see stuff like this on TV and I, I've never seen nothing like this ever happen. Had Mr. Dunn met 69-year-old Alberta Easter before she and her sons were arrested this morning, she might have given him this business card announcing the Easter and Company commodities firm with Mrs. Easter as executive director. Until January of 1986, 
Easter and her family lived in this spacious house in Wayne, Michigan, but they were evicted. Their next residence, the Knights Inn near Metro Airport, where they talked to a number of established businessmen in the area about money needed to start a host of Easter family businesses, but they could not find the funding. The evening managers here at the Knights Inn really don't want to talk about Mrs. Easter, her family, or how long they stayed here at the airport location. That's because for much of the time, the inn wasn't paid for services rendered. Their residence since February 23rd of this year, rooms 105 and 106 at the bungalow. Tonight, they are boarded up for police evidence. Tonight, it is the building that is the curiosity. Tomorrow, more information will be known about the people that investigators say are responsible for the murder of three police officers. From Inkster, Bill Proctor, Channel 7 Action News, reporting. And then the man had a gun, he shot the police, and then the other policeman shot the man about three times, and then they rushed the man off. They're saying that your son shot at the police. As that's well as what, the, police. That's what the, the people are telling me. They shot at the police. Okay. You think your son be the type to shoot at somebody like that? Well, I wouldn't know. You know, I can't tell about these people. Officer Bell was wearing a bulletproof vest at the time of the shooting. He received only superficial wounds. Costin remains in critical condition at Ford Hospital with a bullet wound to the chest. Mother Nature played a cruel trick today on the people of Inkster who have already had enough adversity for one week. Severe winds knocked down trees and power lines onto the home of Ira Parker, one of the officers killed in Inkster last night. The storm ripped through that area late this afternoon, damaging several homes. It was like a train came by. It was just all white and swirling winds, and as soon as it cleared up and you could see again, this tree back here had fallen on this house. The storm quickly flooded roads and freeways like the Lodge and the Southfield, and high water poured into the basement of Garden City Hospital. Now, over in Farmington Hills, the wind tore roofs off of carports, and Dearborn declared a state of emergency because of flooding and wind damage. Detroit Edison says the storm knocked out power to about 20,000 of its customers. Well, here's a story hard to believe. All these storms and the hot weather really have been pushing uh, some people's tempers past the boiling point. Today in Dearborn Heights, a 73-year-old woman's car uh, had washed up on the side of Wilson near Beach Daily by the floods. Now, police say that a man then ordered the woman to get off the grass, his grass, pulled out his gun and shot at her through the windshield. Fortunately, she was not badly hurt. The man was arrested. Sure, the police. ultimate sacrifice made by three police officers will not be forgotten. The community and really all of Metro Detroit tonight is mourning the death of three officers who were brutally gunned down Thursday night by four heavily armed suspects. A routine mission to serve a warrant for a bad check turned into a 10-hour siege, and in the end, three of Inkster's finest lay dead. The fallen officers are 36-year-old Daniel Dubiel, 24-year-old Clay Hoover, and 41-year-old Ira Parker. Sergeant Parker was working as a supervisor when he was called to the motel to assist the other two officers. Tonight, the suburban community is banding together. Calls from people offering help are pouring into the Inkster police station. A fund is being set up to help the families of the slain officers who leave behind nine children and one unborn child. Today, three of the four suspects were arraigned on murder charges. As Channel 7's Ken Ford reports, the three insisted they were acting in self-defense. Alberta Easter and two of her three sons were charged with murder and eight related counts today. The remaining son will be similarly dealt with as soon as a kidney problem permits. As she was led before a judge, the woman told anyone who'd listen that the killings were in self-defense. They attacked me and my son tried to defend me. Who shot you? Who shot the police officer? Yeah, they did. They shot. They shot each other. Did you shoot them? Did you shoot them? Did you order your sons to shoot the police officer? Did you order your sons to shoot the police officer? No, I did not, sir. At a news conference following the arraignments, Detective Sergeant William Ward of the State Police reconstructed the officer's last moments of life and what may have triggered the shootings. The officers were in the room uh, for about 15 minutes until Sergeant Parker arrived. The best that we can find out right now is that uh, Sergeant Parker did walk up to her, put his arm on, on her elbow as if to escort her and say, you know, come with me. And, uh, it was apparently about that point in time when gunfire erupted. There'll be a preliminary examination July 22nd. At that time, the prosecutor's office will present its evidence. The full extent of that won't be known until then. But tonight, it appears that three Inkster police officers may have been killed over a bad check for less than $300 and their efforts to arrest the woman who wrote it. 
I'm Ken Ford, Channel 7 Action News reporting. This is the first time three officers in the state of Michigan have been killed in a single incident, and until now, the Inkster Police Department has never lost an officer in the line of duty. If you would like to contribute to the fund for the slain police officers, please contact the Inkster Police Department. As we said, those men left behind nine children and one unborn child. Bill. The violence of the Inkster shootings is far from forgotten tonight, and incredibly, earlier Detroit police were called to what they thought was a... We'd like to help these families. A special fund has been set up. Your contributions can be sent to Inkster Policeman's Flower Fund, 27301 South River Park Drive. Officers killed last week. And not only is the community supporting these families spiritually, but financially as well. Our Scott Lewis says as funeral preparations are being made, the generosity of the community is overwhelming. We're here because some people did get over the last three days, there's been a steady parade of strangers through the front door of Inkster Police Headquarters. They've come from all over Metro Detroit and as far away as Ohio to quietly express condolences through a contribution to the families of the slain officers. At least 300 people have dropped off donations totaling about $10,000, and more money is coming in by mail. Some people even left flowers behind at the front door. Of course, we all feel sorry, you know, for the families. But I guess it's like being in the service, you're putting your life on the line and it's just i'm just sorry that it happened i can feel in my heart what these families must be feeling with the loss of their loved ones i know how i would feel at theodore's restaurant down the road from the bungalow motel where the shootings happened another collection canister was filling up today in just one hour customers employees and neighboring business owners kicked in five hundred dollars all three slain officers were regular customers here we are outraged uh, matter of fact myself i'm really angry that something like that would happen a mile and a half from my uh, business, and uh, it's too close to be comfortable with it. The Detroit Police Color Guard flanked the caskets of officers Daniel Dubiel and Clay Hoover during visitation at the Harris Funeral Home today. Their bodies and Sergeant Ira Parker's will also lie in state tomorrow. The funeral home is donating its services, a long-standing tradition for police officers who die in the line of duty. On Tuesday, a memorial service will be held for all three officers here at the Inkster Recreation Complex. Thousands of people are expected to attend, including as many as 800 police officers. It'll be a final tribute to the victims of the bungalow moist. did know Sergeant Ira Parker for 15 years. He never had a bad word to say about anyone. That's, that, that's what was so nice. I really enjoy working with him. I just hate that it happened. Gina Ford knew them all, especially Ira Parker. I just remember him always smiling all the time and talking with everybody. Talking with everybody that he knew from Inkster. He seemed like he knew everybody. And another person who knew Ira Parker said if you got into a jam, he'd try to help you out before he'd lock you up. Clay Hoover always wanted to be a police officer. Brian Ferris remembers him from the police academy. He was uh, very ambitious. He wanted to be a police officer. He uh, was a good guy. You get a feeling with these people and when you work with them. And it's a brotherhood. And, uh, he was one of us. The outpouring of respect marked the impressive ceremony. But slain officer Daniel Dubiel didn't really care for ceremony, and friends describe him as down to earth. He lived around the block from me. Dan was a very much a family man. He cared very much about his family, his kids. He was just a very, very sweet, gentle man. They should be remembered not for their deaths, but for the lives they lived and touched. In Inkster, Bill Gallagher, Channel 2 Eyewitness News. Well, to try to uh, shed some light on how those close to the victims, be it the family, the friends, or fellow officers, are coping with all of this, I am joined live tonight by Joe Vernengo, a psychotherapist. Mr. Vernengo specializes in psychological trauma and has worked with the officers and their wives who are connected with the Inkster Police Department, those who survive, those who must now somehow cope with what they saw. Thank you for being with us tonight, Joe. Uh, okay, did you spend your day with the Inkster Police today? I sure did. I stayed over at the Inkster Recreation Center for uh, most of the day, almost to the very end of the funeral. Give me some kind of a sense, if you would, uh, Joe, of what uh, kind of things happened, what kind of uh, thoughts you were passing on to those people. Well, what I looked at over there was a whole lot of people that were extremely traumatized. This is far beyond any kind of ordinary bereavement as we know bereavement to be. What we've got there is a whole lot of people stunned and in a severe state of shock at this time. The wives of the police officers of the Inkster Department are very afraid, and I'm sure that their children are also showing signs of stressed out uh, emotions. How about the officers themselves, Joe? Do they take it even tougher than the uh, families, or is that not so? Well, the officers, as we know officers to be, are strong, 
uh, independent characters, and I don't think that they're showing a lot of that stress right now. But my sense is, is that there's a lot of those police officers in Inkston that are hurting that are going to need to talk about their feelings related to the deaths in Inkster. What do you say to them, Joe? What kind of uh, thoughts do you pass on to them? Is there anything that's, uh, you know, is there a magical formula? It's almost like being a priest, I guess, when you go to a, to a funeral home. What do you say? Well, being a Vietnam veteran, and I've worked with Vietnam veterans, I kind of know what trauma is about. So what I get into them is trying to draw out that their feelings, that they're not responsible for it, that their feelings of feeling insecure are real feelings. And I kind of focus with them a lot on what we call sur survivor's guilt. It's a phenomenon where they feel that they're responsible. A lot of the officers are questioning what they could have done, what they might have done, had they assaulted the motel, and those kinds of feelings, helping them to realize that those are only thoughts that they're having. They uh, may snap down the road as a result of all this, or is that pretty much in check? Well, from an educational perspective and from experience, I would say yes. We need to get in there and work with them. Post-traumatic stress disorder is very real, and it's going to take its toll on that department. How many officers? I don't know at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Joe Vernengo, a, a psychotherapist who's worked with the Inkster Police, the, uh, the wives and the officers who are still remaining in that force, uh, a very difficult job. Kathy? Our team report on the Inkster tragedy continues with a closer look at the suspects. Alberta Easter and her three adult sons charged with the shooting deaths of the police officers eulogized today. Our Steve Crump reports delinquent rent payments, court action, evictions were an ongoing way of life for the suspects and promises to one local bank which were never kept. More information continues to come in that Alberta Easter and her sons were a family who lived with continuous money problems. From these court papers saying they owe $2,500 in unpaid bills at the Bungalow Hotel, to the thousands they owed in delinquent rent on these two homes in Wayne. The buildings were rented by Heritage Savings of Taylor from September of 1982 to January of 1986 when the family faced court-ordered eviction. Where she got somewhere between four and six months behind in her rent, but before that she always paid her rent on time and uh, then also we were in negotiations with her to buy uh, the home she was living in and the one next door. Those who came into contact with Alberta Easter say that she was a woman always waiting for a ship to come in. While living here on John Hicks and Wayne, she oftentimes sought out big loans, backing up the request with big time stories. The owner of this Wayne Road restaurant, Jim Lee Wright, refused to talk on camera, but confirmed that Easter did in fact, on several occasions, ask for loans. Each time, he said no. And bank officials say the alleged big deals they believe were stall tactics to put off rent payments. They were always big deals. And she was talking a million to three million dollars. It was pending. She just couldn't get the money released. Bank officials didn't say how much they were owed. They only admit no, we, their case is closed. Steve Crump, Channel 2 Eyewitness News. You know, already this week, more than half of Joe Weaver's mail comments on the Inkster tragedy. In his perspective tonight, Joe Weaver shares some of those comments. The whole community is still in a state of shock over the sudden and brutal murders of those three Inkster policemen. The comments I'm getting range all the way from firing squads through automatic death penalties to abject resignation. A woman from Fort Myers, Florida, who was here when the tragedy occurred, thinks there ought to be an automatic death penalty or life without parole for killing a police officer or fireman while on duty. An Inkster resident who was a friend of one of the victims asked why. What makes people commit such senseless crimes? She wonders if justice will ever be served in this case. Well, that troubles me as well. Is there a punishment severe enough to match the degree of this depraved atrocity? I don't think there is. On the contrary, if tradition follows in our criminal justice system, the outcome could more than likely be a life sentence with parole down the road. Sometimes I think we're a little too civilized for our own good. If I were the judge in this case, I'd lock them up for good and throw away the key. That may not be strong enough, but what else can we do? I'm Joe Weaver, and that's my perspective. Where will we find the whole story of Jessica Hahn's encounter with Jim Bates? Who lose their lives in one sudden, very violent incident. The answer came in Inkster today as thousands of people formally mourned for those policemen cut down by gunmen at the Bungalow Motel last week. Our Joe Bell was with the mourners today. Today they gathered for grief and giving on a massive scale. The military precision is not always comforting, but it's one way nearly 3,000 officers from all over the U.S. and Canada
tried to give tribute to Sergeant Ira Parker and officers Clay Hoover and Dan Dubiel. They crowded in and around the Inkster Recreation Center, trying to give a little piece of themselves to parents and children and widows like that of Sergeant Parker. We are her brothers now. She's our sister. And the loss of Ira, you've gained many brothers and, many, and a lot of support. And you know who you can depend on. And we'll be there. After the memorial service, a sea of patrol cars carried that sentiment through the streets, where often perfect strangers shared the sorrow. There had to be another way that this could have been solved. Totally senseless. When you have a death in the family, it's nice to know you have friends and neighbors who come by and pick up some of the burdens of everyday life. Here in Inkster, it's pretty much the same thing. They haven't really had a fully functioning police department of their own on the streets for the past couple days. Inkster Police. Mm -hmm. Officers from Westland, Garden City, Wayne, and the Sheriff's Department have been sharing their time, manning the phones and answering patrol calls. Yes, two days of an eight-hour shift. Today, five plus my regular shift. In Westland. We're pretty much a family, and uh, we take care of our own. That goes for civilians as well. Everyone from caterers to limousine owners have been donating services. Uh, Again, a lot of moral support, you know, from. Uh, communities uh, surrounding us and uh, of course we are all at a state of mental depression you know but yet we're keeping our sanity you know making sense of a seemingly insane act will not be easy but as one chaplain put it men such as these gave us hope for a safer world and now God is giving them one where there is no need to put on uniforms and badges and there's no more sorrow or pain in Wayne Joe Bell Channel 2 Eyewitness News an Inkster city official tonight is refuting the story of motel security guard Garland Booker, who said he warned slain officer Sergeant Ira Parker of a possible ambush. Booker told Eyewitness News yesterday that he twice warned Parker that the suspects had automatic weapons. He said Parker replied, I got mine too, then walked inside the motel room. An Inkster councilman, however, doubts Booker's statement. Knowing Parker and uh, Officer Dubiel who were in there, they're very bright officers, and they're the ones that we called upon for many occasions who quite uh, difficult situations. I can't imagine him walking in unknowing without all the facts that they had at hand. If they had additional information, I'm sure that they would have taken the step, proper steps for it. But yesterday, two motel employees said that they saw Booker talk to Parker before he entered the room. By the senseless killing. It just broke our heart to know that this happened to police officers. Tonight, a steady stream of people are showing up at Inkster Police Headquarters. They're dropping off sympathy cards and donations for the officers' families. So far, more than $11,000 has been raised. It just really touches my heart. It doesn't matter that I don't know them. They were there to help all of us. So you want to do something just to show you? Yes, your... and I'd like to do something else, but I don't know what else there is to do. Police officers look at each other like family members, and for Inkster officers, losing three brothers is really hard to take. And most here believe it's going to be a long time before this department really gets back. Questions about why three of their policemen died, and about the way they died. To make things even more difficult, there are new concerns tonight. Questions are being raised about the way police responded to what they thought was a hostage situation at the Bungalow Motel nearly a week ago. News Force Nona Barbie has been looking into those new concerns. Tonight she's joining us to report on this controversy and look at why the scene of this tragedy continues to draw attention. Nona? More the controversy involves charges that some police officers on the scene at the Bungalow Motel fired indiscriminately into a room where authorities thought three Inkster police officers were alive and being held hostage. Had the men lived, critics say the gunfire could have jeopardized their lives. Garbage. Inkster Police Chief James Buckley dismisses that charge. We gave specific instructions uh, when it became apparent that we had some rounds going out from the rooms uh, into the uh, surrounding areas that appeared to be directed toward civilians. However, authorities have admitted that some officers did fire into the suspect's room before the chief arrived. Too much firing was going on. It was a danger to the officers, danger to the hostages. As authorities continue their review of last Thursday's 10-hour siege at the Bungalow Motel, the place continues to draw the curious. Employees and occupants here at the Bungalow Motel don't want to talk about the steady stream of onlookers who have been coming through here. 
they don't want to discuss anything connected with last Thursday night. One tenant did tell me that his neighbors have been keeping to themselves as everyone here tries to come to grips with the deaths of three police officers who were killed in a fleet just a few feet away. James Bradley works at a gas station across the street from the motel. He says people have been visiting the crime scene since the tragedy ended. People still come out looking today, yesterday. I think they come around and just take a look and try to figure out why, why would something happen like that just over a warrant for a bad check. Police are on the scene at the motel to keep people away. At one point, up to 70 people at a time were stopping and staring at the boarded-up rooms where the Inkster police officers died. James Bradley says right up to this day, they keep asking the same question, why? And I'm sure one question the owners have to be asking is, when will the motel get to open again for business? Well, well I was told by a janitor at the motel that they should be open for business Friday, sometime this weekend. They are not closed by police order. They're trying to... In Illinois, them. one Toledo resident who knew her said she was nice and a good neighbor. But for whatever reason, she got into trouble. Franklin Roosevelt was president when she was first arrested. Alberta Easter's career in crime is well documented here. Her first run-ins with Toledo police began when she was a teenager. From that early start, she was frequently booked here on a series of crimes. Those crimes are detailed in Toledo police records. In 1937, she was arrested for her role in a disturbance, then an assault and battery conviction in 1944. That was followed by a series of embezzlement convictions. She was also convicted of selling real estate without a license. When this mug shot was taken in 1961, she faced another embezzling charge. She took money from people that was supposed to cover home payments. Mrs. Easter pocketed the funds. That caper got some notice in a Toledo newspaper when she was still using her married name. She left here in the 1960s to seek her fortune in Michigan. She continued her shady financial deals. And after her first crime here half a century ago, she faces her most serious charge, murder. In Toledo, Bill Gallagher, Channel 2 Eyewitness News. Mrs. Easter's sons grew up and went to school in Toledo. Their Toledo records were clean, but as Eyewitness News first reported, Roy Lemons was arrested here in Michigan previously on charges of a stroke. Stroke at preliminary hearing for Alberta Easter and her three sons. All are accused of killing those three Inkster police officers. The four were whisked into court today in this van with extra police and dogs guarding the courthouse. But there was really no hearing. Easter and two of her sons, Roy and George, have all now been ordered to undergo mental exams first. The courtroom was packed with some 50 spectators and reporters. In the front row, the brother and sister of dead officer Ira Parker. And outside the courtroom, it was clear what many residents wanted. You know, I'd like to see them tortured, because they're guilty. I wish they didn't have to have a trial. I wish they'd just go on and do what they could want to do to them. It would be good enough. Alberta Easter and her sons are due back in court August the 25th. If all are judged competent to stand trial, the hearing will then go forward. And Bruce, you know, we have also learned that one of the suspects in the Inkster killings has a long criminal record that includes acts of violence. Alberta Easter, it turns out, is a familiar face to law enforcement people in Ohio. Her career in crime began 50 years ago while she was a teenager living in Toledo. Back in 1937, she was arrested for her role in a disturbance. But that's not all. She was later convicted of assault and battery, embezzlement, and selling real estate without a license. In one case, she took money from people, money that was to cover home payments, but instead she pocketed the funds. She left Toledo in the 60s and moved to Michigan where she got involved in other financial schemes.